Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introduction and for inviting me to speak at this One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. It's a great pleasure to be here. Although I must say I'm not yet really um, used to doing all these things just online, but I'm also all for doing the best we can with what we have. So here we go. I'm a conformal field theorist by training. And uh, I think as you all know, conformal field theory has incredibly important applications in physics. It's a physical theory, really. It describes phase transitions of second order, and in particular, phenomena where the dependence on the parameters changes from a polynomial dependence into an exponential dependence. And of course, that's a phenomenon that we've heard more about than we would have liked to on the news just recently. I'm not declaring that I have anything to say uh, that will help us with this pandemic, but I'm just saying that conformal field theory is a real is a real thing. So as mathematicians also, I feel that we are obliged to give some background, some mathematical background to conformal field theory, take it as seriously as we can. And that's where I come from. Um, I think we should develop a strong toolbox to understand conformal field theories better. And to the toolbox that I like best comes from geometry. So how can geometry enter in conformal field theory? Very basically, conformal field theory, and when I say CFT, I mean two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, these CFTs actually describe mappings from Riemann surfaces into some other geometrical objects. And uh, that's a picture that you may be familiar from in string theory, where, of course, the Riemann surface is the world sheet of a string and the target, the map that we map into, is maybe some space-time, some physical space-time. But the description is true independently of string theory. I'm not a string theorist. I take a lot of um, inspiration from string theory. Again, I think we should take it very, very seriously. But CFT is a subject that is uh, well-defined independently of string theory. So the description that I just roughly gave is true independently of string theory. And you see that geometry enters at both ends of the maps that I've been describing. Of course, the Riemann surfaces are geometrical um, objects, and the target spaces are geometrical objects. And the target spaces are those geometric objects that I'm actually focusing on. I'm interested in the very rich geometry that one can have in the target spaces, and I'm interested in importing tools from the study of these geometries into conformal field theory. Now, the very process of turning um, the abstract definition or description of a conformal field theory into something that's formulated in terms of geometric quantities is called a geometric interpretation, very roughly. And one of the aims of this talk is to make that a little more precise, at least in the fav my favorite class of examples. And in particular, as the title says, I want to focus on invariance shared between geometry and conformal field theory, because in my view, that's a very, very useful tool to import maybe some ideas that we know from in geometry into conformal field theory. And specifically, here's the plan of the talk. I will begin right away by introducing you to the main player in this game, it's the so-called elliptic genus. Actually, the elliptic genus in a special case and there it's a priori just a very beautiful function in two complex variables. And that's the way in which I would present it first. I'll just talk to you about a particular function in two complex variables, and uh, we'll try to tell you why I find it pretty. And then we will see that it features both in conformal field theory and in geometry. It's actually an invariant on both sides. And that helps us because we can transport information from one area into the other. And that will directly feed into this topic of um, introducing geometric interpretations of conformal field theories. I will summarize how that is done in a particular class that I like best. And then we will turn to some more recent investigations that me and my collaborators have made, where we're focusing on generic properties that certain classes of conformal field theories may have, always aiming at a situation where we understand these theories hopefully better at some point. And then at the end, um, it will become clear that there are more open than closed questions, and I will share a partial to-do list with you that I have on my personal agenda. So what's this pretty function that I promised to you? It's um, this function EK3 here. As promised, it's a function in two complex variables, in tau, which lives in the upper half plane, and in z, which lives somewhere in the complex plane. And um, it's 
defined this function ek3 it's just defined as a weird sum over stuff that uh, is constructed from the classical jacobi theta functions theta2 theta3 and theta4 let me remind you of the definition of theta3 at least i'm giving you the fourier series if you want so this is the power series in q and in y where q everywhere in this talk is going to be the sh standard shorthand notation for e to the 2 pi i tau, and y is the standard shorthand um, notation for e to the 2 pi i z. So with this in mind, here you have the definition for theta 3, and its three cousins, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 4, are obtained from theta 3 by rather simple manipulations like so and multiplying by something. So these are the definitions. EK3 has very beautiful properties, which it mostly inherits from this Jacobi theta function. So let me remind you of those properties for the Jacobi theta function theta three. It's a holomorphic function, both in tau and in z. And that's actually not difficult to prove because we have a rapid convergence here, actually absolute uniform convergence on compact sets. Um, so that's okay. It's also quasi-periodic in the parameter z with respect to this lattice. And by this, I mean that on the one hand, the function doesn't change at all if you shift z by integer. And on the other hand, it only mildly changes if you shift by integral multiples of tau. By mildly changing, concretely, I mean that you have to multiply by some prefactor, which is very much under control. Last not least, this is a classical function. And actually, when you restrict tau to the positive imaginary axis, and when you restrict z to the real axis, then what you get is a fundamental solution of the heat equation in one spatial parameter, namely the periodic fundamental solution. And uh, you can convince yourself of the fact that that's probably true, because if in here you insert tau equal to i t for tau with t, some positive number reflecting the time parameter, and if you insert z equal to x with x a real number, then it's easy to convince yourself that each of these summons actually obeys the heat equation. If you take the first derivative with respect to t, you get the same expression as the second derivative with respect to x, up to a couple of prefactors, but those prefactors are independent of n. So it's not very hard to check that this entire sum is actually solving the heat equation and that it's a fundamental solution. Okay, that's a little more work, but also doable. Why am I telling you this? Of course, for general interest, just to tell you that the Jacobi theta function is a cool object, but also because it's helpful. That last comment is helpful if you've ever worked with heat kernels on geometric objects. If I asked you to write out the heat kernel on an S1, or just here the periodic uh, fundamental solution in one space dimension, then you wouldn't have written this particular one. You have written, would have written something else, which looks more like my expression theta three, but evaluated in minus one over tau and z over tau. But because the fundamental solution of the heat equation is unique, what we get is an equation between your solution and mine up to a couple of prefactors, which are not so hard to work out. And that gives a really important part of the behavior of theta three. It tells you that we've found something that transforms really nicely under the S transform. That's the Möbius transform given by this two by two matrix. And once we're at it with Möbius transformations, you'll probably start uh, trying what happens if you shift tau by integers. And already if you shift by two, you will convince yourself immediately that theta three is invariant. So what we found is something that has modular behavior with respect to an infinite group, infinite subgroup of the Möbius transforms, the group generated by S and T squared the two matrices that I've written to for you here. The weight, the modular weight is one half. That's just the exponent that you read off here when you look at the, um, the prefactor that's um, just in tau. And um, other than that, well, we have all the other nice properties that I already showed you. So that's theta three. And because the other two summons here are just obtained from theta three by rather mild manipulations and not so hard to believe that EK3 inherits most of the properties that I just told you about. Indeed, 
EK3 is what we call the weak Jacobi form. It's still holomorphic both in tau and in Z. It's still quasi-periodic with respect to Z when we shift by lattice, by the elements of this lattice. Just of course here, the prefactor has changed a little bit because we have to take into account that we squared everything there. And also the modularity gets inherited and the modularity even becomes nicer. Sorry, no, I'm on the wrong. Something happened, I'm sorry. Now I'm back. Okay, so the modularity um, is inherited, but it gets better because we're actually taking the quotient of two of these theta functions. So the tau dependent prefactor actually drops out entirely. We are modular of weight zero now. And um, we are actually modular with respect to all of SL to Z because by the particular way we've added the summons here, um, we're not just invariant under shifts by integers, by, by even integers, but actually under shifts of tau by all possible integers. So clearly something's not working here. I'm really sorry. Keep. Okay. Very bad. Just to convince you that this is my only, only my second Zoom talk ever. All right, here we're back to that transparency. Okay, so EK3, I hope I've convinced you of the fact that this is a really, really pretty function in two complex variables. I've introduced it to, just, to you just without any interpretation, but I have introduced it to you because it has meaning to me. It's the invariant that I want to center this talk about or around. It's an invariant both in conformal heat theory and in geometry, and it counts things. So by the fact that it counts things, we will learn to tr translate information between geometry and conformal heat theory. So it's not just a label, it's something that counts things with content. So I have to get to conformal heat theory to tell you how that um, function EK3 actually features there. When I talk about conformal field theory, what I actually mean is a two-dimensional Euclidean unitary conformal field theory. And right here, we're talking about um, super conformal field theories. So there's a little bit of small print here, which tells you about the specific type of supersymmetry that I'm um, using here. Won't be that relevant um, for most of you, but uh, I want to give you all the background. But now for the description of conformal field theories, I've selected just the ingredients to conformal field theory that I'm actually going to use. This is not a definition of conformal field theory because the abstract definition of these theories from a mathematical point of view is too involved to make it interesting in a talk like this. But what we do need is the knowledge that a conformal field theory is indeed a quantum field theory. So in particular, it has a space of states. So a priori, that's just the complex vector space. And here it's equipped with a positive definite Hermitian scalar product that's going to be relevant. And we have infinitely many observables on the space of states. They come from the action of two commuting copies of a superconformal algebra, one so-called left moving and one right moving. And whenever we have something right moving, I signalize that by putting a twiddle on top of the operator. Um, but of these infinitely many observables, we'll only need four. So we're all safe. We only need four. And those are the ones that I'm listing here. It's the Hamiltonian on the left, the Hamiltonian on the right, J0 on the left, J0 on the right. And the J0s can be interpreted as fermion number operators. So they count fermions. What does it mean? Well, mathematically, the only thing I need to tell you is that these are linear operators on our space H. They all commute. And uh, they're self-adjoint, diagonalizable, even simultaneously diagonalizable. And um, they're installed in such a way that this so-called R tilde partition function is well defined. So the R tilde partition function is taking a trace over our space of states. And um, it takes the trace over this interesting operator. So we want to view this as a power series in y, y bar, q, and q bar, and keep track of each of the coefficients. The coefficients then tell us um, counted with a sign, 
what the dimensions of the common eigenspaces of these four operators are, J0, J0 tilde, H, and H tilde. So if you haven't seen a partition function, you're of course familiar with this concept. In conformal field theory, we make sure, just by the definition of these interesting theories, that these R tilde partition functions, again, have beautiful transformation properties in tau and z. Again, here, y and q are e to the 2 pi i z and e to the 2 pi i tau, respectively, with tau in the upper half plane and z in the complex plane. And my definition of conformal field theory says that I will only call it a conformal field theory if this function is well defined as a function of tau and z. And if it has these nice transformation properties, which should look familiar from the previous transparency, because we have modularity and we have an elliptic transformation property, just that here you also see stuff that depends on the complex conjugates of z and tau here and here. So actually, these R tilde partition functions behave like products of a weak Jacobi form with the complex conjugate of a weak Jacobi form. That's what it is. And um, when previously for the weak Jacobi form, we had weight zero, that's the same here. And I should have pointed at this exponent previously for EK3, the exponent was minus one. And here it's minus C divided by six, where C is an important quantity that specifies some of the properties of our conformal field theories. It's the central charge and for us it's always gonna be real. So that's the context in which I want to use conformal field theories. There's lots of stuff hidden behind these dots here, which won't be relevant for us, but this is the structure that will be relevant for us because in this setting, I can tell you what the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus actually is. It's a function in two complex variables, which looks very similar to our R tilde partition function. Actually, the only difference that there is is that I'm gonna drop the Y bar contribution. I just drop the Y bar in the de definition. So this is the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus by definition, and you will agree that it looks just the same as Z with the only difference that Y bar is just not in there. And I can do that, one can show that this is always a well-defined function. But dropping Y bar actually has serious consequences. On the one hand, this becomes a holomorphic function in Z. It's also holomorphic in tau. And that's unexpected from the formula that I wrote because we still have Q bar in here. But the fact that the Q bar dependence drops out entirely is actually a consequence of supersymmetry. I didn't use supersymmetry yet, but now I will. It's a consequence of supersymmetry because the supersymmetry here, among many other things, says that our Hamiltonian can be written as d d dagger plus d dagger d up to a factor of two, where d is what we call the supercharge. It's an odd linear operator on our space of states. It squares to zero, and d dagger is just the adjoint of d. So being able to write h tilde in this form immediately tells you that h tilde is positive semi-definite, something I remarked here already. And it also tells you that the kernel of h tilde is just the intersection of the kernels of d and d dagger. Why would we care? Well, because the operator d leads to a situation where the eigenvectors of h tilde are paired up. They come in pairs because h tilde commutes with d. I told you that d square is zero, so we'll check immediately that h tilde commutes with d. Whenever you have an eigenvector of h tilde, call it v, then d applied to v will also be an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. But it will have the opposite parity because d is odd, and that's why that eigenvector will enter with the opposite sign right here. All the other eigenvalues are the same, so the contributions of these eigenvectors will cancel out in the trace. The only situation where V doesn't have a partner that cancels these um, contributions is the case where DV is zero, so when we're in the kernel here. We can say, play the same game with the dagger and again see cancellations. So the only contributions that don't cancel out are those that sit in the kernel of H tilde. So actually, in this trace here, we're reduced from the trace taken over H to the trace taken over the kernel of H tilde. This contribution Q bar to the H tilde is actually a multiplication by the number one. So the whole expression 
doesn't see any Q bar contributions, it's actually that one has to prove it's holomorphic in tau. And it inherits all the pretty properties from Z. So it has all the properties that we saw in EK3 on the first transparency. It's the weak Jacobi form, it's modular of weight zero, and um, well, it's, uh, it's elliptic with some kind of power here. And indeed, the function EK3 that I showed you on the first transparency does feature as an example of an elliptic genus in certain types of conformal field theories, which we will get to in a little bit. Um, but way before we do that, I want to push this idea of reducing to the kernel of H tilde here just one step further. Instead of just dropping Y bar in the definition, I'd also like to drop Y. This now amounts to inserting Z equal to zero in this expression, or equivalently, Z equal to zero in this, this expression. And by the same argument that I gave you previously, now we're reduced to taking the trace over the intersection of the kernel of H tilde and H, because also H, the left-handed Hamiltonian, can be decomposed just in the same way like the right-handed one. So this means that when we evaluate Z, it, the capital Z and little z equal to zero, then we're actually taking a trace over the intersection of the kernel of H and H tilde. So actually both these contributions are one. We're just adding pluses and minuses and we get an integer. And that's an invariant of a conformal field theory called the Witten index. Is there a question? I'm seeing someone raising their hand. I can't hear you. <laughs> No questions yet for now, so. Okay, good, <laughs> good, okay, fine. Okay, sorry. So this is an integer, it's called the Witten index, and it's an important quantity again, which, uh, well, can be used in classifying conformal field theory. All right, so that's the conformal field theory side of the story when I want to tell you what the elliptic genus is. There's a geometric counterpart to it, and uh, I will try and explain that next. And don't worry if there are a few words on this transparency that you're not familiar with, you can use them as a black box. I'm going to explain some of them and the others are probably not so relevant. So we're gonna work on so-called compact Calabial defaults. These are special complex D-dimensional manifolds with a lot of extra features. In particular, um, almost by definition, these Calabial manifolds allow solutions of Einstein's field equations, so they carry Ricci flat, flat metrics. On our compact manifold, we will be considering holomorphic vector bundles, E, and as soon as we have one of these vector bundles, I'm going to be interested in its holomorphic Euler characteristic. That's a number that I can extract from E, and here's the definition for those of you who are familiar with twisted cohomology. So it's an Euler characteristic. And when you give me a bundle like that to play with, I'm going to construct new bundles from it by some combinatorial tricks like here. So for instance, I'm interested all in all the exterior powers of E, all of them at once. So here I'm summing all of these exterior powers and to keep them apart, I'm introducing a formal variable X to the M in front of each of the lambda M E. So this is a weird thing. It's a formal power series with a formal variable X, X and it's coefficients are holomorphic vector bundles. But there's no problem with this definition. This one is actually tame because the exterior powers become zero when M is sufficiently large. So this is a finite sum. So that's not the point of it. It's a formal expression. And as long as I don't ask about convergence, this could even be an infinite sum. And I wouldn't mind. Like here, this is an infinite sum. It's the symmetric sister of the lambda E S M denotes the M symmetric power of E. So also here I'm introducing a formal parameter X, raising it to the power M just to keep the different summons apart here. To make things worse now, I'm going to take an infinite tensor product of expressions like this. So here we have the exterior powers and the symmetric powers. Curly T is the holomorphic tangent bundle of M. It looks terribly complicated. We're taking infinite powers, we're taking well, formal variables y or y, to, y times q to the n or this expression or that expression, it's a bit of a mess. But all I want to tell you is here's the definition of something that turns out to be a formal power series with formal variables q and y now. And the coefficients are holomorphic vector bundles. 
and they're defined by this formula here, I could spend half an hour and explain to you why this is very natural. And it is actually, it's, it's not just an arbitrary expression. It has very many good properties. But um, I actually want to do something else. I'm just giving you this expression and trying to convince you that here's a closed definition and this is nothing but a formal power series um, in form of variables Q and Y, whose coefficients are some interesting bundles cooked up from the geometry that was given to us in M. Because once we have this so-called virtual bundle, we can define the complex elliptic genus. It's just the holomorphic Euler characteristic of that terrible monster. And by the holomorphic Euler characteristic of such a power series, I mean a power series where we're taking the Euler characteristic of each of the bundles that shows up as a coefficient there. All right. Long story short, I've defined something that is a form of power series in Q and Y, and that looks terribly complicated and probably not very convincing. But as a matter of fact, it turns out that this is a proper well-defined function in the complex variables tau and z. If I now remember that Q wanted to be e to the 2 pi i z, e, pi, e to the 2 pi i tau, and Y wanted to be e to the 2 pi i z. This is a holomorphic I have, function. I have a yeah? stupid question. Uh, okay, please. The, the, you have, you defined an elliptic genus. Do you have a hyperbolic genus? Not that I know of, actually. So uh -huh. here, actually, the whole point is that an elliptic, an elliptic curve is hidden in the picture. So actually, in the parameter tau, tau wants to be the modulus of an elliptic curve. So it's not so much about elliptic differential e uh, equations or operators, it's about an elliptic curve hiding here. And okay. I don't know how to generalize it into a hyperbolic world. It's a good question and might be very, very interesting. But um, here, here, that's what we have. Thank you. OK. So, but yes, uh, I mean, we have a parameter tau hidden here. It's a um, complex parameter. And we are now suddenly allowed to turn these formal variables q and y into proper power, I mean, exponentials of tau and z, respectively. And you guessed it probably, E has interesting uh, properties with respect to tau and z. It's actually always a weak Jacobi form, um, just like the EK3 that I introduced in the first transparency. And, and another and, and, stupid question. Yeah. Where, where did you use that the manifold is Calabi-Yau? I mean, the, ah, the very good question. You can make this definition for every complex manifold, compact because we have to take some index integrals here. So you need to have an, uh, you need to be sure that the integral is well defined, the integral over all of M. I need to assume that it's Calabi-Yau when I say, tell you that this is a weak Jacobi form. The transformation properties are not quite that nice. You still have interesting transformation properties under modular transformations and elliptic transformations if you use an ordinary complex compact manifold, but you won't get um, weak Jacobi form. So in order to say, which I didn't even write here, but in order to say that it is a weak Jacobi form, I need the Calabi property, right? Okay, but uh, so this has similarities already to the um, conformal field theoretic elliptic genus. And actually uh, the string theorists tell us that you should expect the complex elliptic genus on a manifold M to agree with the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus for conformal field theories that arise as nonlinear sigma models. Uh, excuse me again, you define the weak okay. Jacobi uh, form on a torus, but here uh, M is uh, a general complex, I, I mean, a Calabi-Yau manifold. No, so. I, no, no, tau, 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 is the, um, tau is the parameter that specifies an elliptic curve. Uh, here to construct, a function e in these two variables, tau and z, um, I use the geometry of the manifold M. Oh, okay, okay. So it's still, it's a function for every fixed manifold M, and I'm assuming Calabi-Yau, so I have all the nice properties that I want. For any complex compact manifold M, with the formulas that I gave you, you can construct A function in two parameters tau and z. Ah, so, so the tau and z uh, are, are actually on a torus? Uh, or... 
tau is the modular of the torus, and z wants to be a parameter on that elliptic curve, which explains why I had this quasi-modular behavior. I want z to be a parameter which I could view um, as a parameter on, on the elliptic curve given by tau, indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an expectation that the string theorists tell us about, and it holds true in the very simplest cases where we can check it, namely for complex tori of any dimension, and if the dimension of M is small, if it's less than or equal to two. Um, actually, you might ask, I told you about the special value that this, uh, con this conformal field theoretic elliptic genus takes when you insert z equal to zero, it gets a constant. I call it the Witten index. What's the constant that you get when you insert z equal to zero into this expression? It's the traditional Euler characteristic of the manifold M. So you can view the complex elliptic genus actually as a refinement of the Euler characteristic. And if you're familiar with index calculations, then you can even check that this might hold true. Um, you can rewrite this terrible expression here by an index type integral like so. And um, the xj in here are the churn roots defined up here. And um, now, I mean, even if you've never seen this expression before, it's easy to see what happens when you insert z equal to zero because this expression becomes independent of tau on the nodes. And then you're taking the integral over the product of all the churn roots that's by definition a top churn class and the integral taken over m with the right normalization is indeed the Euler characteristic so this is something one can check by means of the definition here okay so these are the three areas that i need to introduce for background i've told you about the function ek3 i told you about the complex elliptic genus i told you about the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus and now I'm interested in the cases where all these three meet, in particular um, in the conformal field theories where this equality here holds and um, where we produce the function EK3 that I had on the first transparency. And the setting where this happens is the setting of K3 surfaces. This is why I called that function EK3. So here I can make my life easy by defining K3 surfaces as the compact Calabi-Yau manifolds of dimension two, whose Euler characteristic is 24. So that's a low key definition and it works because we have uh, some serious mathematics working in the background here. The Calabi-Yau manifolds in complex dimension two have been classified. Each such, such compact Calabi-Yau manifold in complex dimension two is either homeomorphic to a complex torus or to another thing, and that's the K3 surface. So here I'm kind of picking the parts of that result that make the definition look easy, but the definition doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you know that there are not very many cases of complex two-dimensional Calabi-Yau manifolds. Yet we can use this insight from geometry and just copy it in conformal field theory to say which conformal field theories we want to be interested in. Those are the so-called K3 theories. And by, definitions, the, by definition, these are superconformal field theories of the type that I introduced two transparencies back. Now I'm fixing the central charge to be six on the left and on the right. That's the analog of fixing the dimension up here. And I'm fixing the Witten index to be 24. That's the analog of fixing the, the Euler characteristic. And now actually the surprising thing happens, one can show that among all superconformal field theories with central charge six on the left and on the right, there are again only two cases. There's one case where the Witten index vanishes, just like the other characteristic for the torus vanishes, or if it doesn't vanish, it's actually 24. So we have this um, dichotomy also for the conformal field theories without having, you know, uh, having done anything to them. That's just a fact. And for the experts among you, um, one can show that all superconformal field theories with these properties actually have an extended supersymmetry. The supersymmetry is extended to n equal four, and we should view these theories as n equal four superconformal field theories, if that tells you anything. Otherwise, just ignore the comment. 
Okay, so these are the two settings in which I want to apply the elliptic sinus, and it won't come as a surprise to you if I tell you that now for those K3 surfaces, the complex elliptic sinus actually agrees with the function EK3 that I introduced at the beginning. And for the conformal field theories, if we um, focus on K3 series, all K3 series have as their conformal field theoretic elliptic sinus the function EK3. And if you've forgotten what it was, here's again the definition of that function. It comes defined in terms of, um, weak, uh, of uh, classical Jacobi zeta functions. And I would like to use this fact, this fact that these particular conformal field theories, of which there are many, share an invariant with these particular complex surfaces, um, of which there are many as well. But before I actually put this into practice, um, I want to discuss what I mean by how many, that there are many. Um, K3 surfaces have been under intense investigation in algebraic geometry for at least 100 years. And for the last 50 years, there's been lots of progress. So we can make very precise, um, what, but, uh, it, we can be very pre precise in saying what we mean by uh, how many K3 surfaces there are. And um, we've also been very successful in copying these strategies from geometry into the realm of conformal field theory in order to say how many K3 series there are. That's, of course, a slightly younger subject, but this is basically the result. We know that there's an 80-dimensional, this is real 80-dimensional moduli space of such K3 series. We don't know how many connected components it has. We believe that there should only be one connected component. That's a belief coming from string theory, but um, we don't have any means to prove that belief. So anyway, one of the connected components, which I call MK3, is particularly well under control. It contains all the nonlinear signal models that we can construct um, immediately, and we know how to describe MK3. It has a partial compactification, um, which can be given in terms of these group theoretic data here. And you can read this as follows. This part is a Grassmannian of positive definite oriented four-dimensional subspaces of a vector space like this, a 24-dimensional real vector space equipped with a natural scalar product of signature 4,20. And actually to state how aware um, a given four-dimensional subspace is positioned, you would have to choose a basis of R4,20, preferably an integral basis, and to get rid of all those choices at the end, you have to divide out by this group. All this becomes more natural once you've observed that actually the total K3 cohomology is a vector space of exactly the type that I've explained to you. It contains a lattice, integral cohomology, so that would serve, serve as your integral basis. And then this is almost geometric, because if you um, know how to describe geometric moduli spaces of K3 surfaces, you will know that they are in general modeled on the second cohomology, which in turn is a 20-dimensional real vector space with a natural scalar product of that signature and also contains a lattice of integral cohomology. So this brings us very close to giving geometric labels, at least, to our conformal field theories. If this is a space of K3 theories, we can somehow use this geometric, these geometric ingredients in order to at least label our K3 theories in terms of geometric data on K3 surfaces. And that was actually done in a beautiful paper by Aston Morrison in 1994, where they explain how to define geometric interpretations. And at the end of the day, it just goes down to a little bit of linear algebra. Where the main point is that we need to observe that at this point here, I made a choice. A priori, if I read this from right to left, as I did originally, then this space comes without any grading into H0, H2, or H4. And as soon as I speak of H2, I've actually made a choice where in the 24-dimensional vector space, the 22-dimensional vector space is situated. And that's a choice which amounts to a choice of a geometric interpretation. And more systematically, what Aspen Moore Morrison do is the following. They observe that between this space and that space, there is a two-dimensional real vector space. 
um, that's actually given by H0 and H4, and to choose this embedding here, it's more convenient to choose the directions of H0 and H4. You can do this by choosing two generators, actually integer generators, normalize them so that scalar product is one. And then in order to give geometric labels to any point in our moduli space, you do the following. You remember that this was the space of four dimensional subspaces in here. So any point up there is given by a four dimensional subspace in here. And that four dimensional subspace can now be decomposed like so, where this part is three dimensional because sigma is actually three dimensional. And this is nothing but the intersection of X, which is four dimensional with H2 plus H4. One needs to use the specific signatures and dimensions that we have here to actually prove that this is a three dimensional space, but it is. And sigma is the projection of this space onto H2. So get rid of the H4 contributions. So we have a three dimensional subspace of X under control. You need one extra direction to actually specify all of X. And again, one can show that one can bring it into this form here. Um, so that the generator starts with epsilon naught, the vector that we chose up here. And then the rest of reading of geometric data is um, straightforward. You need to decompose this vector into its H0, H2, and H4 components. H0 was fixed. The H0 component was fixed to be epsilon zero. The H2 component is going to be called B. And we're interested in this prefactor of the H4 component in particular, the number V here, which turns out to always be a positive real number. So long story short, this is a little bit of linear algebra. Of course, I'm being too fast for everyone to follow this, but trust me, once we've chosen these two vectors, you can decompose X in this form and extract from X this triplet of information. Oh, sorry. This triplet of information, sigma V and B. Sigma is a three-dimensional subspace of H2. V is a positive number and B is a two form. And now you ask your friends from geometry or from string theory, they will tell you that sigma and V together already specify uniquely a Ricci flat metric on a K3 surface. B is called the B field. And here you end up with precisely the data that you need to fix to fix a nonlinear sigma model on M. So that's rewarding. I gave a long speech to tell you that this moduli space, which we found abstractly and which has a very abstract kind of formulation, allows you to assign to every point in the moduli space data, geometric data on a K3 surface that are uniquely the sigma model data that you need in order to specify a sigma model. So you had to make a lot of choices. This is a choice from an infinity of choices here. So a geometric interpretation is an interpretation for sure. And uh, you and I might find different interpretations and both might be good, but still it's rewarding. We can label all RK3 theories in terms of these geometric data. And this is exactly what the string theorists would have predicted because the prediction is that all K3 theories should have constructions in terms of nonlinear sigma models. Okay, so far so good, but this is dangerous because I've just reformulated things in that language. I've labeled everything in terms of geometric data and the labeling was very successful, but it's kind of just labeling. It's not clear whether any of this geometric labeling has any influence on describing the K3 series per se. So you see, I mean, I've been starting to work on this uh, in my PhD thesis, and this is from 20 years ago. And since then I've been collecting evidence in favor of the idea that actually, yes, there is some geometric content to these K3 theories and it's more than uh, just labeling. And we have plenty of evidence. And um, the context in which I want to show you this evidence today is the context of these, um, invariance shared by both sides. Because remember, 20 minutes ago, I told you that the K3 series and the K3 surfaces share the elliptic genus as a common invariant. And the elliptic genus is not just a label, it counts something. In the conformal field theory, it counts states. In the surface, it counts dimensions of cohomology groups. So there's 
some information that gets translated between the two. So let's, let's take a closer look at that once again. Here's a reminder of those definitions we discussed them previously, the elliptic genera in both settings, conformal field theory, and um, well, any Calabial manifold here. And indeed, the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus here, I've already written it as a trace taken over the kernel of H tilde because I told you that that's what it reduces to. And within this kernel, the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus counts dimensions of common eigenspaces of J0 and H. But there's a problem, it counts these dimensions with signs. And I'm not worried about the minus one to the J0 here. That's gonna be the same sign for everyone with the same eigenvalues of, with respect to J0 and H. I'm worried about J0 tilde here because states in these common eigenspaces will contribute with different signs to the counting here. So we're actually adding and subtracting dimensions so there's no way of working backwards. If I know the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus as a function of tau and z and its power series expansion in y and q, still I cannot reconstruct the kernel of H tilde from it because I only know these prefactors in terms of, uh, well, um, dimensions that are counted with signs and there will be cancellations in there. So there's no way of working backwards. At least it's just as terrible for the geometric elliptic genus, the complex elliptic genus here, would be interested in the dimensions of these twisted cohomology groups. But again, we're counting them with signs. The minus one to the J actually can't be kind of used to work backwards. Q and Y powers don't distinguish between different values of J. So we're adding and subtracting dimensions and the final coefficient that we can read off in front of any power of Q and Y um, doesn't allow us to work backwards. Not a problem is the answer that I get from my string theory friends. Kachur and Tripathi in 2016 actually suggested to do the following to fix the problem. They introduced a new parameter in the story. They refined the elliptic genera, speaking of Hodge elliptic genera then. And um, they refined these elliptic genera by introducing a new parameter, u, which keeps track of the eigenvalues of j0 tilde. And similarly here in the geometric side of the picture. So now we will get a power series in Y, U, and Q, and collecting the coefficients. Those coefficients will give us information about the common eigenspaces, the dimensions of the common eigenspaces of J0, J0 tilde, and H. That's what we wanted. And similar here for the dimensions of these cohomology groups. Very good. So they declared victory. They said, I found a new invariant, the Hodge elliptic genus for Calabi-Yau manifolds, and we also know the conformal field theoretic counterpart. However, sadly, this was too quick because actually we've destroyed all the properties that we liked in the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus. Um, the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus and the complex elliptic genus are invariants precisely because of those cancellations here. They're indices. So it's a trick and an Euler characteristic that you actually cancel contributions, uh, which uh, kind of get rid of uh, non-essential information. So these actually are not invariants. For the Hodge elliptic genus for kalabi yau uh, manifolds, mm, these dimensions of cohomology groups are not necessarily invariants. For the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus, one can see almost uh, immediately that this expression is never an invariant on any of the moduli spaces of conformal field theories that we know of. So that's a bit disappointing, but I want to say that this is a really, really beautiful and insightful paper. So that comment that I have a new invariant here, which is shared in conformal field theory is not quite true, but um, actually their ideas are very, very important and very inspiring. And if you read what they wanted, if you read their, their, their paper, actually, it kind of becomes clear what I think what they wanted to do. They wanted to construct something that is generic. So instead of this definition, what they actually wanted to do was, at least for K3 theories, where we know how to do this, to construct a generic form of this conformal field theoretic elliptic genus across the moduli space. What do I mean by that? Again, Interpreting this function here for any conformal field theory means that we will focus on the coefficients 
of any monomial in Y, U, and Q in this expression. The coefficient give you, gives you a dimension of an eigenspace, common eigenspace of these three operators. That dimension will, of course, jump as you change the parameters within the moduli space. Even if everything depends smoothly on all parameters, you know this from linear algebra, because the dimension of the eigenspace is just the multiplicity of the vanishing of some characteristic polynomial. And even if the characteristic polynomial depends completely smoothly on all the parameters, the dimension will jump at some point. The multiplicity will jump at some point. However, there's a generic minimal value to the multiplicity. The jumping can only happen non-generically and upwards. Sometimes the multiplicity becomes larger. So it makes sense to take the minimum everywhere, the minimum absolute value for each of these coefficients everywhere and declare that that's the function that we're interested in. That's a theoretical idea. We'll talk about constructing this function a little later. Um, more concretely, what I'm trying to say is that it makes sense to construct a vector space H0, which I want to call the generic space of states. This is going to be a space that carries an action of H J0 and J0 tilde. And it's supposed to be made in a way that H0 is contained in the kernel of H tilde for every K3 theory. So for each common eigenspace of these three operators, I'm going to take the minimum dimension across the entire moduli space, and that's going to be the dimension that that eigenspace will have in the generic space of states. Does it make sense? Am I getting the zero vector space? No, actually, we're getting an infinite dimensional vector space. So only with that information can you appreciate that it might, this might be a construction that is worthwhile following. And then I think what they really wanted to define um, at least I suggest to define is this generic Hodge elliptic genus for, case three, for a conformal field series where we're taking the trace over this would be generic space of states H0 instead of the full kernel of H tilde. And what we're taking the trace of, that's the same expression. All right, so what do we have? Definitely, I've defined an invariant here. It may not be terribly interesting, it may be impossible to calculate it, but it's an invariant, let's say, for K3 series. It certainly differs from this one because, it's, as I said, it's easy to see that the space is actually smaller than that one for any theory that we know. Does it agree with the Hodge elliptic genus that Kutcher and Tripathi uh, defined for K3 surfaces? For K3 surfaces, they actually give a beautiful proof that they actually do define an invariant. Despite the problem with these dimensions here, these are invariants for K3 surfaces. So for K3, we're on safe grounds. This is a new invariant, a beautiful new invariant that Kautschur and Tripathi have discovered. Is it the same like that one? Unfortunately not. And when I noticed this, I thought it's a big tragedy because it means that our very nice convenient description um, of the elliptic genus in terms of this virtual bundle won't help us a bit when we study conformal field theory. Up to then, then, everyone, including myself, thought that this is going to be a model to find generic properties of K3 theories because of the fact that it produces the complex elliptic genus, which is shared with conformal field theory. But now refining this complex elliptic genus with the additional parameter, we see that we don't get the same expression. So that's a bit tragic, but there's hope and I will explain to you how. So first of all, those results are summarized here. Kutcher and Tripathi proved that for K3 surfaces, their Hodge elliptic genus is an invariant. Second, um, the, well, the, the, the generic conformal field theoretic Hodge elliptic genus, which I introduced on the previous page, is an invariant by construction. I can calculate it explicitly. I have a closed formula for it. It's again an elliptic function. It's not modular, but it's mock modular. So that's pretty good. And actually it has some use already because by studying this function, I can prove a prediction made by the string theorists who have predicted that the superconformal algebra of our K3 theories is generically not larger than n equal four. Excuse so me, you what just mean uh, yeah. mock modular? Ah, okay, that's a separate, that's a separate uh, talk that I could give. 
Um, that's a notion originally discovered by Ramanujan in his late about by, by um his late in, by Ramanujan in his latest letter to Hardy, where he finds a couple of weird functions which look a little bit modular but not quite. So he calls them mock modular. But he just gives a list of I think 17 examples. And it's been an open question for a long time how to actually make a definition out of that observation. Um, and that's it was actually done successfully by Sanders Vegas, a student of um, Don Sarkis in 2000 in his thesis. So there's a definition of mock modular forms. Um, so they're not quite modular. Um, they have um, well controlled extra contribution under modular transformations that I would have to, you know, have to would spend, have to, would, would have to spend three or four transparencies to actually define it. But um, if you're familiar with n equal four superconformal field theories, the characters of the n equal four superconformal algebra, actually the, of the irreducible representations of the n equal four superconformal algebras have mock modular behavior already at c equal to six. So the mock modular behavior had been independently already discovered by the physicists. This is Eguchi and Taramina in particular, who had calculated those characters and already noticed that they're not modular with respect to SL2Z um, Möbius transformations. There's some, um, some infinite, uh, infinite sum that contributes extra on top of what you would expect from a modular um, transformation. So I'm sorry, I can't kind of make this more specific at this point because it's no, actually thank you. It's, it's an incredibly interesting topic, actually, and I'm putting it here as a keyword because I think it might mean something. Uh, it might meet some, mean something that this is mock modular. And uh, well, technically, it's related to the fact that we're expressing everything in terms of n equal four characters. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this comment here um, refers to something I said earlier, where I said K3 theories should be viewed as n equal four superconformal field theories because they are, but there's still the possibility that by introducing these theories, we've constructed something which generically even has higher supersymmetry than n equal four. It's not expected from string theory, and now we can prove it by looking at this uh, new invariant here. All right. Also, I can uh, give a closed formula of the Hodge elliptic genus for K3 surfaces, which was abstractly discovered and, and constructed by Kachu and Tripathi. We have a closed formula for it. And uh, that's cool, but what's not cool is that with the formula, the cold art truth hits us. These two are not the same. I have closed formulas for both of them, and they disagree. So this virtual bundle E is out. We can't use it in order to get additional information about conformal field theories from it. However, all along the discussion of the elliptic genus, um, there was a second candidate for giving geometric models of, say, this generic space of states that I've introduced. I always thought it gives the same answers, but now we know it doesn't. And the second candidate actually survives the test. The second candidate is the so-called cohomology of the chiral Durham complex. So I've decided not to introduce this gadget here. I'm just saying there's another geometric construction of a certain type of cohomology. It's closer to string theory and uh, thereby probably stood a better chance to actually model the generic space of K3 series, but it's much more technical than the virtual bundle E that I introduced earlier. And it's also not traditionally used in mathematics, which is why I didn't in, in, introduce it here. And um, actually, it's as I said, it's much more technical than what I actually introduced. But I think it's, at least it may give you a good feeling, OK, there's something one can do, and it's geometric. We have a model for the generic space of states. It's just a little bit hard to work with it. And probably that just means we don't understand it well enough yet. So as to disentangle um, the technicalities in the definition. So. I think this is great news because now we have a generic state space of a generic space of states shared by every single K3 theory in this 80-dimensional moduli space. So that should help us, for instance, in constructing those theories or getting a better hand of uh, what they actually are, apart from those examples that we can already construct. And since then, we've been uh, again, collecting further evidence in favor of the fact that this might be a feasible project. For instance, um, more recently, together with Antonina, 
we've managed to explain completely how this generic space of states sits in the space of states of a family of theories which we have well under control. These are the Z2 orbifolds, and um, we're looking at maximally symmetric deformations of these guys. And to our surprise, we discovered that this embedding here is actually governed by an unexpected S2 action, which we try to interpret there. So that's just as a you know comment that of course this project that this, this subject is wide open. I think uh, it's important news that tells us that we can import geometric tools from um, that we can import geometric tools into conformal field theory in a useful way by constructing these generic spaces of states. But I admit that probably these comments are rather marginal unless you're really working in this subject. So let me end by sharing a to-do list with you. So the original question maybe in the outset when I started working on my PhD on K3 theories, <laughs> among others, how to construct these theories. We have an 80-dimensional moduli space. And in this 80-dimensional space, we know how to construct theories in rather small sub-varieties. The largest sub-variety that we have under control in here is 16-dimensional. So that's way lower dimension compared to 80 dimensions. So there is a vast majority of theories that we really don't know anything about, apart from the fact that we know their generic space of states, which is shared by all of them so far. And then one would like to introduce extra structure on it. For instance, we do expect the vertex, uh, a structure of a vertex operator algebra on it. Uh, if things go well, there's going to be a universal vertex operator algebra underlying our elliptic genera. Then once we have that in dreamland, we would be able to discuss whether that vertex algebra structure is compatible with the action of finite symmetry groups. One would expect the action of this huge finite group, mature group M24, for reasons that I also didn't get into. This is a very cool observation by Eguchi, Oguri, and Tashikawa in 2010, who observed that my favorite function EK3 actually decomposes in a very non-trivial manner into irreducible characters of the mature group M24, uh, uh, characters of irreducible representations. And that's still a mystery why this is so and to explain why. We already know that the group M24 acts on the generic space of states. So that's already progress because we now know the home of the action of M24, but to really explain this mature moonshine phenomenon, which would be the final question that I want to ask here, one would have to make the action compatible with a vertex operator algebra structure. So these are just four bullet points of giving a broader context of where this research is going. But uh, for now, I think I've said everything I wanted to say, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Are there questions? I, I have a question uh, about the methods that uh, that you use, that one uses in uh, uh, in this area. What uh, I mean, what what, do, uh, what tools from mathematics uh, uh, are useful? I, well, I, I suppose linear algebra, but uh, 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 but uh, so, so do you use I don't know uh, some PDEs. Uh, so, some inequalities, uh, functional analysis, or do you use some geometry, complex analysis? We use a lot of complex analysis in studying these particular functions. So actually to work with them, you have to have a good handle on um, elliptic functions and the characters of these superconformal algebras. And um, I mean, here, a lot of algebraic geometry actually enters in understanding, I mean, this is just linear algebra, of course, the stuff that I shared with you down here, but actually to expect this kind of decomposition to be useful and to understand why Ritchie flat metrics are then um, parametrized when uses algebraic geometry. And then as a next step, I try to say that now we're actually since 20 years of working on collecting evidence and trying to show that this is more just than just labeling K3 series we're actually studying symmetries of conformal field theories quite a lot. 
and we're studying symmetries of conformal field theories that are induced by symmetries of K3 surfaces. And here, in translating from the geometric context into the CFT context, I have to use the methods of algebraic geometry to explain how those symmetries act and how to describe them in the language of these moduli spaces. So here, a lot of um, algebraic geometry enters. And then um, to deal with the conformal field theory, so for instance, in this project with Anne that I mentioned down here, this is actually uh, linked to beautiful work by Keller and Sade, who study the formation theory of conformal field theory. So this is actually perturbative um, analysis of deformations of conformal field theories. So there's uh, some functional analysis entering here. There's lots of representation theory entering here. Rep representation theory of, of Lie groups or of, of, of what? Lie algebras, yeah. Lie so we need infinite dimensional super Lie, Lie algebras okay. here. So these are these, yeah. yeah. Like, okay, a lot of SU2, a lot of SU2 enters as well. So, I mean, there's, yeah. there's a little bit of Lie groups. So that's the easy stuff. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that's, I mean, we don't get to use very fancy um, Lie algebra representation theory here. We yeah, but uh, the... So, so the, the uh, infinite dimensional Lie algebras. This means Virasoro, uh, mostly Virasoro and uh, super Virasoro. Yes. Yeah. So okay. And then hopefully extensions of that. So the points in moduli space that we understand better already are those where the uh, um, super Virasoro algebras are extended to larger um, infinite dimensional Lie algebras by also having um, some. Um, some Lie algebra corresponding to a Lie group in there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? <laughs>